Good. And let's hope we can go on to the next slide in a minute. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to do in this very short talk is to concentrate um, on the connection between what we are learning about the Welsh um, early medieval carved stones um, and how this might relate to the um, framework, the research framework for 2022. So I'm going to begin by looking at very briefly at new discoveries um, between 2016 and then 2021. Then I'm going to concentrate on the carved stones from the excavated early medieval contexts um, at St. Patrick's Chapel. Now, because I've got to go through things pretty quickly, I just want to comment briefly on the kind of things that we can find about the St. Um, from the sculpture that's been found at St. Patrick's Chapel. So you'll have it in your mind when I'm actually talking about it. Firstly, um, we, we, the chronology, because it's from an excavated site, is very, very important. Secondly, we can say something about the functions of the monuments. Thirdly, we can begin to say something about Christian belief and the archaeology of emotion. Um, we can recognise the work of both professional and non-professional artisans and, and variety of craft practices. We can see things to do with language and literature, illiteracy, sorry, in the inscriptions. There's also um, a, a boat, so something can be said potentially about the technology of this. And of course, um, we can begin to see wider Irish Sea cultural connections. Um, and then at the very end, I'm just going to um, emphasise the importance of protecting and preserving monuments for future generations with one example. So firstly, new discoveries. Um, this is the only new discovery in the Northwest. This is from Bontnewydd in Gwynedd. It was found in the rubble of an agricultural building on a farm. And um, you can see here it's Viking age because of the ornament, a sort of little um, carved pillar stone with a cross on two different sides, actually, as you can see, two adjacent sides. And this is um, probably around the 10th century. Secondly, um, I would like to thank um, Robert Gapper for um, contacting me about his discoveries, I know he's here this evening, of carved, uh, cross-carved stones from Henvenu in Ceredigion. And um, he's found two cross-carved stones, which you can see here. And um, he uh, pointed out to me that they're found in walls in the fields, not very far from the early medieval church site of Henvenu. Now, many of you know that this has um, a connection with the cult of St. David, his uh, connection particularly um, in hagiography with his father. And it's interesting to point out that the um, second of the stones, um, the one on the, um, in the middle center uh, right, this one has parallels with one of uh, in the cross form with one of the small uh, boulders from St. David. So it's very interesting to see this parallel, but um, we need, I need to think more about it um, and actually see the stone because I haven't seen it, it was found during lockdown um, uh, before I can say anything more at the moment. And then four, uh, sorry, three new stones from Pembrokeshire, two found by myself. Um, uh, the first one that came to light um, uh, was the St. Dogwell's Church one, which I didn't um, find. That was found by David and Anne Eastham. It's just built into the fabric of the church. Then um, last year when I visited uh, northern Pembrokeshire and southern Pembrokeshire, firstly on a walk um, in Llanander under Parish, um, we came across a wayside cross, and you can just about see the cross there, which um, I think is one that's vaguely mentioned in the 1890s in Archaeologia Cambrensis, but hasn't been seen since. 
And then I also went back to look at a, um, a stone in Penali Churchyard in southern Pembrokeshire, and there is some incredibly weathered carving on this particular stone, which um, is only visible really in um, midsummer. So those are the new discoveries since 2016. I now want to move on to the main part of the talk to talk about St. Patrick's Chapel. Now, I think the, the importance of this site in many ways is because the carved stones are actually found in situ during a scientific excavation. Most of the, um, almost all uh, carved, early medieval carved stones, whether they're here or in other parts of, of you, uh, Britain and Ireland, are not found in situ. And this gives the site of St. Patrick's Chapel a much wider importance for understanding things like chronology. Now, um, the first type of monument, which um, uh, Ken referred to, are small uh, freestanding crosses, which are used from grave, which are made from grave markers. And all the sculpture, as far as I can see, is local shale. And um, we can see here is on the left, is the one that is associated with grave 26 with, and the um, radiocarbon date from the uh, burial um, you can see there um, is 669 to 779. Um, it may be as late as the early 9th century um, but we need to wait for all the radiocarbon dates and Bayesian uh, statistical analysis in order to be able to date this material rather more precisely. Um, but the importance to archaeologists and indeed art historians is that we can then begin to um, date specific monuments much, much more closely. And though the um, uh, artistic side of these stones is very um, limited, it nevertheless has implications for sculpture elsewhere. And these two monuments, like many of those at St. Patrick's is not made by a professional sculptor. Um, the ornament is very likely incised and you can see a cross in a lozenge here. A lozenge is um, very, very much easier to do than um, a cross with a ring round it. And we can see some very poorly uh, misunderstood interlace boss um, down on the this stone, which was not found in situ. It was found on the shore below because of the erosion of the sand by the weather and the sea. So that's the first type. Um, those were, uh, um, but we also have um, several cross carved stones which are incorporated into the graves themselves. Now, when I um, published in the corpus, the stone from St. Patrick's Chapel, which was found in 1970, you can see it center right there. I was not absolutely sure that it was a monument. And this was because the cross was very, you can, is, is barely more than scratched onto it and it was found uh, facing down I think as a lintel of a kiss grave and the finding of in the excavation of other examples of this was absolutely fundamental because it tells us that these cross carved stones are not only used to as grave markers, perhaps at the head of the grave, the west end of the grave, but they're also actually being incorporated into the structure of the grave itself. And this has implications for belief. But I think it also um, has um, wider implications. We can just see um, the example here of an infant grave with um, a likely incised uh, cross with a lozenge that is over that that was facing upwards um, 
and not downwards into the grave, but we'll come back to an example that was facing downwards into the grave in a second. But you can see, again, it's very lightly scratched with a lozenge shape around it. Now, the wider implications of the fact that it's incorporated into the grave is that we have other um, monuments where there's been a lot of argument as to what extent they uh, monuments are part of the grave structure as opposed to marking it, the actual grave. Um, there's Longor uh, Bay or uh, um, a Longor in Carmarthenshire, which was found during an extreme archaeology excavation in the uh, mid 2000s. And this I originally interpreted as reused in the grave, but in fact, it was um, a lintel stone over the grave. So maybe um, I misinterpreted this in the corpus. But the wider implications are for, um, for uh, monuments like the, the name stones from Lindisfarne and particularly those from Hartlepool, which were found in antiquarian excavations. Um, uh, they date to the late seventh and eighth centuries. And the, there's been a long argument as to whether these were incorporated into the grave fill or they um, mark the grave. And equally, we have in um, Brittany, uh, you can just about see here, um, a cross uh, with a little inscription. And that was actually incorporated into the grave rather than marking the grave. So I think we need to think um, again, about whether all these cross carved stones, of which there are many in southwest Wales, in Ireland, and in western Scotland, marked graves or were within their structures. Now, we also have um, the idea that these cross carved stones in graves are symbols of belief. And this is one of the um, uh, some examples. The burial 93 is a late one. Um, I'm not quite sure where I assume that burial 92 is as well. And in the case of um, these uh, burial 93, um, this kind of coffin shaped burial, there's a cross on both sides. So a cross facing upwards that is lightly incised and one facing downwards. Now, I think that this immediately brings home to us the fact that these infant graves um, were marked by cross carved stones that were not professionally carved and that these were presumably produced um, by, perhaps by the family, by the mourners, and they're part of the performance of burying an infant um, and reflect on the one hand, the grief of the mourners in my view, but also on the other, they reflect um, the Christianity, the, um, the link with Christianity for these um, infants, because from the seventh century onwards, we have um, increasing evidence of the importance of, in theology, of praying for the souls of the dead. And there are inscriptions in Ireland and in, in Wales that indicate that this is coming in. But I think also that this is a very simple way of demonstrating um, the uh, Christian connection and the idea of benediction um, and prayers for the soul of these souls of these infants. I want to think about this in more depth in the future, but um, uh, I think that we can use these uh, very much as symbols of belief um, connected with these infant burials. I now want to talk about what I'm calling a prayer station. Um, it's very similar in some ways to some of the lechta that are known from early medieval Ireland in places like um, Inish Murray. And um, I think that perhaps we should tentatively see it um, within its enclosure as a place where people landed um, at Traith Maur on perhaps as pilgrims on the way to St. David's and then uh, they 
prayed um, at this spot, um, which is clearly associated with St. Patrick um, at a, at least a later date. And um, they may indeed have come from Ireland or they may have come from elsewhere um, as pilgrims from around the coast of, um, uh, of Wales. Now, um, we've already seen that the stones, um, the slabs here are decorated. And I'll come back to the central one in a minute um, on another slide. But um, I think the great question here and I don't know the answer, is that um, to what extent these slabs were incised as graffiti, and this is the first time we have graffiti from a, an early medieval Welsh site, and these slabs were then incorporated um, purposefully into the prayer station, or to what extent some of the graffiti was added to the prayer station, um, uh, either immediately afterwards or by subsequent visitors. And the uh, problem here is exacerbated by the craft working area that Ken mentioned earlier. So we can see the uh, a major uh, monument, perhaps mid eighth century here, Ken was suggesting, um, a stone with a platwork ring cross. It's got um, a a, a curved top, which is interesting because it's rather like the top knots um, on the uh, Irish crosses from Aheny and um, Kilkiran, which I haven't seen elsewhere. And then um, it's just decorated with plat work, but it's unfinished. It's clearly unfinished and it's quite um, rough and ready. So um, it's not intended as something that's finished, and um, which is why I wonder whether it could be a motif piece on quite a large scale that is then placed in the um, uh, on top of the prayer station. And then you can see a, one with a cross um, at the bottom here, and we'll come back to the middle one in a second. Now, the one of the sides of this um, prayer station or whatever it is, um, has a stone um, which has a boat which you can see it's very very um it's very very difficult to see it's absolutely tiny when i i saw it um and also there is an inscription and um we could see the two of these things i don't know whether that suggests um a wave or something um you've got a boat here um uh with a uh, steering oar and then five oars, and then possibly a mast here. I'm not quite sure what this bit is. And then um, you've got uh, a personal name. It's an uh, Donoek. It's um, very uh, thankful to Patrick Sims Williams, who has identified, who has read the inscription um, for me. It's a uh, personal name. It's Irish, and it's the form of the name is archaic by the uh, mid eighth century. So, and you can see an enhanced photograph of it here. Then this is the middle stone on top of the, um, uh, on top of the uh, prayer station. And this is the most exciting of these graffiti stones because you can see um, on the one hand, you can see uh, a, a human figure, now, the human figure is very simple, and, but the, the hands, the arms are raised. And this raises the possibility that we have an Oran's praying figure. Um, I did toy with the idea that the thing next to him or her was a, a shield, but I don't, having seen the drawing as opposed to seeing it in it, the actual stone, I think that um, a figure possibly praying um, is the best answer. Then at the bottom, we can see a cross carved roundel. And then we can see a series of grids. These grids are both um, a rectangular, as you can see, and um, diagonal. And 
the question is, is whether these are grids on which you might set, you know, plan patterns or interlace or something of this kind. Um, they seem very, very uneven. So I'm not sure that we could, uh, initially it was thought they might be gaming boards, but I don't think, um, some of them are very small as well. I don't think this is likely, but there's also a second inscription, um, which at the moment, uh, um, we can't read apart from the letters in the middle, but there are other letters on either side. And we therefore we don't know whether it's actually saying something or it's just a series of letters. But this may be trying out again, um, writing. There are also a series of fragments. And I just put three up here um, of uh, uh, obviously drawing something with compass. Uh, 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 compass here and then various grids and a possible cross there. These uh, seem to me to be very like um, motif pieces, um, most of which have been found in Ireland. So what we've got here um, is uh, uh, the first Welsh example of a site with these graffiti um, slabs. And these are usually associated with ecclesiastical sites and the kind of activity um, at St. Patrick's Chapel may have been associated um, with St. David's, which is only a couple of miles away at most. And we can just see some of the parallels here on the left. You've got um, Nendrum, where you've got um, uh, in County Down, where you've got examples of lettering and also of motifs, uh, tricatra knots in this case, being uh, tried out. Then um, you can see some examples um, from uh, the island of Inchmarnock on the Clyde, um, a hermitage site. This is a, game, uh, a gaming board here, but you can see also the kind of grids that um, seem to be the sort of thing that we're finding at St. Patrick's. And then also um, some complicated motif pieces from the site of Grantshire, which I think is County Antrim, if I remember rightly. Um, this is a site which we don't understand as well, the actual context, but it could again be um, ecclesiastical, but it could be cra a craft working site because these motifs, uh, motif pieces are associated particularly with craft working and therefore some of the slabs that we're seeing at um, St. Patrick's would seem to me to be linked with these craft working areas and it may be that there were others that have been washed away by uh, the water by the sea. Um, one of the stones in the uh, associated as part of the um, uh, lecht or whatever um, is uh, by a skilled artisan. All the rest are not um, uh, the uh, all the rest of the sculpture, the cross carved stones and um, the other uh, material, uh, the freestanding crosses are, I don't think, by professional artisans. But this is quite a sophisticated piece of carving. It's reused facing inwards as a side of the um, prayer station. And you can see, um, this is my photograph of it um, in the David Archaeological Trust offices. And you can see the very crisp carving. It's not weathered at all. Um, it's quite a simple cross, the sort of cross we would associate um, with the 7th to 9th centuries in our sort of typology of monuments of this period. But again, hopefully we can tie it down much um, clearer with the chronology. So I hope that I've begun to show you the importance of the carved stones from St. Patrick's. My research is only very much at its beginnings rather than at, it, at its end, and I may change my mind about things. But finally, I'd just like to make a plea for um, protection. This has always been an issue with these um, uh, early medieval carved stones. Many are scheduled, but not all. Others are built into listed buildings, but not all. 
and they're also, of course, subject to weathering. Now, this was a site, um, it's uh, at Llanllower in the Gwine Valley of northern Pembrokeshire, and I, I visited this in June 2020, and I hadn't been there for about 20 years. It's got four cross-carved stones associated with it. Um, 20 years ago, it was in good repair, and now you can see the state of the building. And um, you can see here's uh, one of the two that are built into the gate here. And then there's two that are built into the fabric of the church, of which this one here is um, in the bit that you can see the uh, has been vandalised within there. Now, this is part of, a con uh, of uh, something that's happening to many, many churches in uh, Wales are becoming redundant and there are changes of use. This one doesn't seem to have a change of use. It's, it's just becoming derelict and will probably fall down. So the question is, how do we protect such carved, early medieval carved stones for the future? And I think it's incumbent on us all to try and, and ensure that these remain for future generations. Thank you very much.